It's certainly a bit daunting when I look around the room and, and as Rob said this morning, some of the people that are here, uh, these people that have lectured me uh, in the room, there's some people that I've stolen ideas off um, in the room. So, you know, I, don't, I certainly don't have, have all the answers and I guess the, the purpose of, of today's session is to really, okay, let's, let's highlight, let's challenge some of the current thinking around talent identification and, and development but also in particular just share some insights on a, on a case study that I've just recently finished um, that I started a while ago um, on, a, on a New Zealand rugby context and just having a look at you know, talent identification and, and development. So certainly keen to share uh, some of those things with you today. I can assure you I won't be singing. Um, it's, it's certainly I, I have not been identified as talented in that area. I think I think it's important to just sort of background sort of where my perspectives have come from in, in talent identification and, and development. So I'm a lecturer at Unitech in, in coaching and skill acquisition. Um, I currently uh, just started a secondment at Sport New Zealand as a talent development consultant. As Tanya said, I'm also a student here at uh, Otago University, just completed a master's in this area. Uh, I've been a coach with Auckland Rugby for a number of years now. Uh, this year I was the Auckland under-19 um, A coach. Uh, and I've got three, three beautiful daughters. I'd have, to, I'd have to say after Jackie's presentation, I was pretty keen just to give them a ring. Uh, <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to check a couple of things. but uh, <laughs> they, um, And it's interesting that Janine's speaking uh, in, the, in the room next door. My wife's an ex, an ex netball player. Um, I'm around 6'3", she's, she's just under six, 6 foot and Netball New Zealand have the Hunt for Height project on at the moment and you know my, my eldest there Emma, she's, she's fairly tall so I was sort of hoping to, to sort of see if we could get some early ID on, on, on these two and for those of you that understand the, the relative age effect I think I've done quite well with these two, um, born in March, uh, got, got even better with the middle one, born in, born in February. Uh, missed my timing a little bit with Jess, it's October. Um, however, I'm working pretty hard on her, on her characteristics and, and a bit of grit and determination, so hopefully we can, we can get her over the line somewhere. I think, it, I think it's really important when we look at talent identification and development and to just highlight the reality of the space that we work in. Um, it is pretty messy, it's pretty muddy, and it's pretty dynamic and talent involves a number of different dimensions and, and a number of different interactions of a number of different sort of areas. Um, and I often, uh, you might have heard this, this story before from, uh, from Robin Jones when he talks about coaching's like holding a bird. And if we hold the bird too loose, well the bird's just going to fly away. If we hold the bird too tight, well we're going to crush it. But regardless of whether we hold the bird just right, too loose or too tight, we will end up with shit on our hands. And it's, <laughs> I think that's, that's a reality of, of the space that, that, that we work in. Um, however, I don't think that's an excuse to not, and I guess using the, the theme of the conference, I don't think it's an excuse to strive for excellence. How can we strive for excellence around the identification and the development of, in particular of, of our youth. So what do we want? When we identify talent, what is the criteria that we want? And I've been at a couple of conferences recently where we've done an activity where we've brainstormed uh, what we're looking for. I'm a little bit tighter on time, so I've done that for you. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're looking at a number of technical skills, uh, tactical qualities, decision making, and then we've got our, our physical attributes. And then we've got more of our behaviour or our character traits. And it came out in Rob's presentation this morning, the importance of work ethic, you know, coachability, leadership, resilience, commitment, are they motivated? Um, do they persevere? Are they a team person? Are they self-reliant? Now obviously this, this list isn't exhaustive, um, and I'm sure there's things that I've missed and there's things that you might argue shouldn't be up there, but I think at the moment we are reasonably clear about what we want. 
uh, and there's quite a bit of data or quite a bit of evidence that supports in particular these attributes here. And the importance of these attributes and the development of these attributes to be high performing athletes. And there's a range of, of literature and stories around that. R New Zealand rugby's been fairly clear for a while around the behaviour and the character piece. Uh, one quote from my research is, you know, we don't want dickheads. No dickheads, that's our, that's our mantra. Um, Steve Hansen's been um, quite public in the, in the no dickheads thing. We've had this focus and this emphasis on character. And then I'm sure you've all heard of the, the better people make better, better all blacks. And this came through very strongly in, in my case study that a real emphasis on behaviour, a real emphasis on character, um, and the importance of those things and the link to on-field performance and the ability to engage and the ability to train, um, etc. But I think a critical question now is well, how do we measure it? How do we know, how do we assess the criteria that we want? We're reasonably clear on what we want. I think the next gap or piece is how do we know? How do we, how do we measure it? The physical stuff's easy. We've got a long history of physical tests that we can do in order to measure and assess physical, physical competencies. A number of you will be incredibly um, proficient coaches and you can go and watch and you can see skill. That's the easy stuff. What's maybe not so clear cut is the behaviour stuff. Is those other characteristics or that other criteria that we want and the character, well how do we measure it? How do we assess it? <coughs> Some strategies that we used, uh, not only in my study, but also in a study done by Kelly and Hickey in AFL, doing homework on players, um, interviews with players and athletes, interviews with parents, interviews with teachers, talking with coaches, uh, looking at school reports was one that came through uh, in my study, getting hold of the teacher, looking at the school report, seeing what type of kid they are. Um, going and visiting them in their home were all strategies that came through. One thing that was quite interesting in the Australian study was that when they did home visits, they went and had a look at the player's bedroom and made an assessment of the player's bedroom as to whether they exhibited certain behaviour traits or not. This is uh, an Otago student's bedroom. I'll let you decide whether you think that exhibits talent um, or not. Uh, this is my middle daughter, Georgia, and this big trophy here is the Revan Naidu trophy. Now, unfortunately, she's been set up a little bit because at uh, Howick Primary School last year, she was awarded this trophy as the perfect student. Perfect student, so she's sweet now. Yeah, she's <laughs> the perfect student. Once you got that label, you should be you should be all right. But I can tell you now that if they'd gone and looked at her bedroom, there is no way she would have got anywhere near winning that trophy. So back to the question: How do we measure it? How do we know? And how easily can we see it? Thinking about behaviour, thinking about character. Performance is often what we can see, uh, and it's also what we can often easily measure, physical, technical. However, the other traits that we're keen on, which are often the drivers of that performance, well, they're not so easy to see, or we can't really see, unless we go looking in some other directions. And it's a lot harder to measure. And if I was to summarise some of the, the stuff from, from my research is these coaches and managers in, in rugby, in a reasonably high level of rugby, we're actually getting to the point 
you know what? We actually don't know. We're actually not sure how we know. We're actually not sure how, how we measure this stuff. And so they were getting to the point where, well, we know what we want, but we're actually struggling to think about, well, how do we measure it? And this is uh, an interesting quote from, from Kelly and Hickey, uh, and I'll let, you, I'll let you read it, because I think it sort of highlights some interesting stuff. I find it, I find it interesting, and this was, was similar in, in my study, that when, when all the stuff that we think makes sense, and we do all the testing, and we do all the homework, but when it all boils down, it's that. It's our gut feel. It's what it boils down to. It's our, it's our perspective. It's how, it's how we see it. We can be as, as scientized as we like, but when all those things at the end of the day it comes down to, well, well what is our perspective and what is our, what is our gut feel? A number of you might have, might have seen this before. You know, what do you see? Do you see a, a young woman? Do you see a old woman? Or a, can you see both? And I could be talking all I like about the young woman in the picture, but if that's not your perspective, if that's not how you view things, then we're not going to agree um, if we don't have an understanding of where our perspective comes from. Because how good is our gut? We don't necessarily th see things as they are. We see things as we are. From our place, from our perspective. And I'll touch on this a little bit, a little bit, a little bit later on, but I, I think for me, uh, a real key take home is, how good's your gut? What, why do you believe what you believe? How good are you at identifying talent? How good are you at measuring the characteristics that you seek and we'll unpack this a little bit as we go, but what are your experiences that have led you to think the way you do think? So I think we need to be maybe as, as coaches and selectors a little bit more conscious of how we see things. But it's interesting how, how we think and what we assume suddenly looks quite unexpected. So have a chat with someone else couple of questions I won't I won't give you long um, so how do you measure talent what strategies do you use and maybe think about well, what are some of the potential consequences of the strategies that you do use I guess what I want to do is just highlight and get you to think about well okay how do I measure what I want and what are the strategies that I'm using to measure that and well, what are the consequences of the way that I go about doing that. One thing from my study was the purpose of the use of the criteria. What we want, what was the purpose of that. Um, and so one of them was to weed out having, having too many projects. Uh, that was from, from my study. From the AFL study was they really wanted to, to try to limit the players who might cause, cause trouble in the, in the club and try to limit um, how much time you're spending on, on athlete or, or player uh, management. If you like to try to avoid having dickheads in, in the system. But this was, this was quite an interesting perspective from a very experienced coach, was the place for rough diamonds and the, the feeling that there was a place for rough diamonds. They might be physically have all the attributes, and incredibly skillful. However, maybe weren't quite ticking the character, behavior traits box. And his thoughts were, well, that's their work on. That's their area of development. I sometimes wonder with this push around behavior, 
character, whether we're expecting the finished product at the start. If someone comes to us that has a gap physically, or let's say, use a rugby example, can't pass off the left hand or tackle on the left shoulder, as coaches, we get quite excited. So, well, I can fix that. That's, that's my job. But if they're not good at communicating, they don't turn up a couple of times, they maybe drink a little bit too much or whatever it might be, we sort of go, no, we cut that. We're not selecting that. That's poor character. So it was an interesting perspective because his thoughts were, well, you develop them, and then what an awesome diamond they might turn out to be. Um, and so it was, it was interesting, sort of his perspective was a little bit different on the, on the character and the, and the behaviour stuff. So his, his big point was understanding them, understanding well, what's their upbringing, what's their background, what's, what's their environment, understanding why certain things or you know, why they maybe hadn't had the opportunity to develop certain characteristics and behaviours. What maybe were the gaps in their life? And we'll take this a step further in a minute. And so he talked about how he felt he'd had quite a privileged upbringing. His father was a lawyer, grew up in, in quite a, a privileged area, um, and he felt a massive responsibility as a coach to try to understand different backgrounds, different experiences, <laughs> and how that had shaped their development. Because what's interesting is this idea of adversity and challenge. There's a, there's a body of research around at the moment that is talking about high-performing athletes, elite athletes, have actually at some stage been exposed to some form of adversity, some form of, of challenge. And in fact, in one article it talks about that talent needs trauma. And so Rob touched on it a little bit this morning about you know, how you cope with and the skills that you develop through going through adversity and challenge. But I think this leads to an interesting point for me, is when we are assessing let's say when we are selecting, when we are making judgments on athletes, what if they're going through tough times? And what if those tough times are creating quite a bit of adversity and challenge? And as a result of that, it's exhibiting in some fairly poor behaviour that we, from our perspective, go, that's poor character. And so this is an interesting one when we think about assessment, our snapshots of assessment, understanding what's, what's behind the scenes, what's the, the bottom of the iceberg that we can't see, and how is that impacting on, but also knowing that a degree of adversity and challenge is actually important for future success. And so again, a key, a key question for me is... Do we understand how the behaviours that we want are actually developed through life experience? So we know we want resilience. We know we want perseverance. We want internal motivation. We want work ethic. I think the trick now is, well, how are they developed? Are we expecting cut and polished diamonds in those areas? <coughs> Or are we prepared to maybe get a bit of a rough one and that's the area of development? Or understand what's underneath? What can't I see that might be impacting on that behaviour? Also knowing adversity and challenge is important in building those skills, which we'll look a little bit in a bit. We expect that often, don't we? Quote from my study, as long as they're tracking all the time, that's what we want. It's only when they start to plateau or level out that we put the spotlight on them. So there's the expectation that when we're developing athletes that we're seeing that. So this is how we think. 
We think that growth occurs in this nice straight line towards some form of endpoint that we're developing towards. And it makes sense. Development program, improvement, we want to see continual improvement. Unfortunately, that's not quite how development tends to work. We tend to get jumps, we tend to get slumps. Um, development is far more dynamic, it's far more rockier than a nice straight, straight trajectory. In fact, those of you that deal with teenagers will attest to, um, there is quite a bit of instability in, in youth. We see a lot of range, we see a lot of sort of a roller coaster ride, and so development is actually quite unstable. There's some fairly clear unstable times through, in particular, a young person's development. But what's interesting is if we expect that, but that's taking place, but what's also interesting is those unstable times are actually critical to improvement. We need to be unstable to get better. Athletes need a degree of instability, level of stability, instability, level of stability, shake that cage again, level of it, in quite a, a dynamic way. Which then sort of, you know, there's two choices, two paths to take. One is easy, the only reward is that it's, it's easy. A smooth, clear, easy pathway is actually not the best pathway. And again, some research is supporting that if challenge and adversity is important, too easy a pathway is actually problematic. But then the question is, are we guilty of actually making it too easy and actually providing too much support? Right, let's, let's give them some S&C Sorry, we'll just give them some nutrition. Um, you know, give them more coaching. Hold their hand just that little bit more. And is, are we guilty of actually making it too smooth and too easy? So I've already talked about the importance of adversity. And so I think maybe a, a good thing for us is to think about, well, okay, how can I as a coach optimise challenge? Now this isn't about creating trauma for the sake of creating trauma. This is understanding the unstable times. And this is how can we create some challenge, put them through that challenge and then debrief the challenge. How can we help them learn the skills and the attributes that we know are important? Coping with setbacks, coping with pressure, being self-reliant, persevering through hard times. And so rather than smooth it out and make the pathway quite, quite clear and easy, create a bit of challenge and how do, we, how do we go about creating that challenge. Right, so another quick chat to your neighbour. How do you monitor athletes during development? Maybe think about well, what do you monitor? How do you support them during unstable times and how can we create challenge? Just another interesting thing, um, in the literature but that came through in, in my study is this desire to win and in particular to win at age group level. So we want to win age groups, under 16s, under 18s, under 19s, under 20s, whatever, whatever level you like. But then in the same breath, well, we also want to develop for the future. So we have winning, we want to win and we want to develop for the future. Well, what's interesting is there's some thoughts that you can't actually have both. It's hard to have your cake and, and eat it. But maybe if we take it to the next level, if a focus on one, what impact does it have on, on the other? And so again, this was something that the participants in my study were starting to grapple with. Well, okay, players can win a game for us now. Well, that's the here and now. We'll select them to win a game now. We also want to develop them for the future, but what they're realising is that they're actually not the ones that they're using in the future. And so there's this sort of, well, how do we get a balance between the importance of competition, 
the role that winning plays in development and then appropriate development. And this is interesting now that some research is suggesting that organisations sacrifice winning at age group levels to ensure appropriate development for future success. Because we assume that junior success will translate to senior success. It's one of our big assumptions is that performance at an age group level can be transferred to performance at a senior level. Unfortunately, the nature of development, unfortunately how they might perform at that level or whether that pathway is nice and smooth, I win here, win there. Not a lot of research supports this, the transition from junior success to, to senior success. And again, sort of some of, the, some of the reasons for that, this is under nine league, this idea of the early developer versus the late developer, or if you're, you're on time, whatever that means, right, it's about now. Um, and s often when we select with the mindset to win at age group level, we're far more likely to select early developers. Bigger, taller, faster, stronger. A study done in the UK in rugby league um, basically confirmed that coaches picked the bigger players when they were picking age group sides. However, there wasn't a lot of transition from age group sides to senior sides. Because often, when everything evens out, they can't necessarily maintain that advantage when, every, when development finishes and everything sort of evens out in the, in the long run. Well, I thought this was worth throwing in this idea of leave your, your ego at the door and someone else mentioned it this morning um, and it came up twice by two different people, in fact I think one of them might be in the room, um, around the role of ego. Uh, in martial arts it's a common saying to leave your ego at the door. If you want to get better you can't bring your ego in to the training environment. You cannot expect to win in every session. Um, brown, the, the idea of belts in martial arts, the colours are all a new fancy thing to try to make a little bit of money, but it used to be you'd have a white belt and you never washed it, and as you trained over time it would get so dirty it would turn black. But then what's also interesting is as you keep training it starts to fray and actually becomes white again. And they talk in martial arts that once you get your black belt, well, that's good. You're now a serious beginner. <laughs> You've trained long enough now. Now you can actually learn something. And it's interesting, this idea of, of leaving the ego at the door. And I, I think it's a great message that I, I wanted to support is that maybe we need to leave our ego at the door of athlete development. It's the athlete's needs that are important. Maybe not so much ours. You know, let's check our gut. Let's be, let's be conscious of the way we think. Let's be conscious of how I see things. Let's understand how the behaviours that we want are actually developed through life experience. Let's make a real effort to help athletes deal with the unstable times and if they aren't experiencing unstable times, create some. Let's see if we can balance winning with a longer term development focus and let's leave our ego at the door. Yes, I'm done. Look at that, that's not, that's not